So our first, uh, our first uh, participant is Crystal Feinster, who teaches African American Studies and a American Studies at Yale University. Her first book, Southern Errors, Women in the Politics of Rape and Lynching, came out in 2011 with Harvard University Press. It focuses on two women journalists, Ida B. Wales, Wells, who campaigned against lynching, and Rebecca Latimer Felton, who urged white men to prove their manhood by lynching black men accused of raping white women. I'd like to particularly note in the context of this panel that this book was awarded an honorable mention in the Darlene Clark Hine Award of the Organization of American Historians. Please join me in welcoming Crystal. First, let me say it's a real honor and privilege to be on this round table. Um, I'm still trying to figure out really why I'm on it, but um, I'm happy to be on it, to say the very least. And in full disclosure, I actually wrote two papers for this um, event, and I had a panic attack at 2 in the morning. And I was like, the first one was really, um, it's more about my personal experience um, and how I benefited from a lot of the work and changes. Uh, that the Committee on Women in History has sort of pushed the profession to make in terms of returning to leave, being a spousal hire, having a husband be a spousal hire, all that stuff. But I sort of freaked out and oh, this is too personal and it's, I don't have to So I decided on a safer paper, um, which really talks about um, the importance of women's history and how it's changed over time. It felt like safer ground and an important enough to talk about today. So, um, when we reflect on the history of the CWH, it is difficult to ignore the deep connections between feminist politics, women's history, and the increased number of women in the profession. The dynamic relationship between women's and gender's history and feminist politics over the last five decades has not only changed the profession, but the way we do history. In the 1970s, women of color in various disciplines and women's historians working in the field of African American, Southern, and labor history began insisting on the significance of examining race and gender together, what we now think of as intersectional politics. And um, I'm really talking about U.S. women's history today, so sorry about everybody else, but um, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about, sorry. Um, the racialized gender politics of the Reagan-Bush era, however, forced feminist scholars to insist that their scholarship be heard in national politics and to articulate more nuanced theories of race and gender. The categories that feminist and women's historians theorized in the first flush of the 1960s and 1970s were arguments for gender equality that drew on arguments for racial equality. The wholesale backlash against women's equality in the 1980s and 1990s provided a covert means to undermine the redistributive goals of racial equality and provoked new theories of understanding intersectionality. Most significantly, Anita Hill's 1991 testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee that Clarence Thomas, the Supreme Court nominee, had sexually harassed her, challenged um, women's and gender historians to reconsider the powerful and all-encompassing constructions of race, gender, and sexuality, to um, re-engage old questions about sexual and racial violence, and push beyond static and unitary formulations of race and gender to include new ideas about class and sexuality. The convergence of race and sexual uh, convergence of race, sexual politics, and sexual violence that had been at the new nexus of both African American women, African American women, and Southern um, the convergence of race, sexual politics, and sexual violence that had been at the um, nexus of both African American women's and Southern women's history were at the heart of the Hill Thomas controversy. The hearings, however, made painfully clear that theories on race and gender had left feminist activists and scholars ill-equipped for the theoretical, ta theoretical task at hand. Few outside the field of African American women's 
history had grappled with the questions regarding the dual impact of sexual and racial violence on African American women and their relative invisibility in the fields of both African American and women's history. It comes as no surprise that the scholars of African American women's and Southern women's history challenged Thomas's representation of the hearing as a high-tech lynching and called into question a history of lynching that ignored sexual and racial violence against black women. Because the American South built a system of racial oppression that depended on a gendered rationale, the protection of white Southern womanhood for the alleged from the alleged threat of black men, they understood race and gender as mutually constitutive. Taking particular offense with the ease at which the Senate dismissed Hill's charges of sexual harassment, um, Thomas's political deployment of the discourse of lynching and his construction of his sister as a welfare queen, African American women, many of them women's historians, fought back in mass with a full page ad in the New York Times entitled African American Women in Defense of Ourselves. In the aftermath of the hearing, both Evelyn Brooke Higginbotham and Elsa Barclay Brown put forward new theories of problem to problematize the assumptions embedded in African American and women's history that made black women invisible. While Higginbotham defended race as a matter of language, Brown argued that women in gender history could no longer afford to ignore the racialized and class-specific histories of women's sexuality and stereotypes and their different histories of sexual harassment and sexual violence and proposed African-American culture as a nonlinear model for incorporating questions of difference into intellectual and political discussions. Leading the way with her 1992 essay, Nell Painter called for a return to the history of slavery and argued that the sexual violence of the slaveholding South made women of different races and class, classes into co-mothers and co-wives as well as owners and suppliers of labor and required analysis that did not stop at the color line. In 1993, Jacqueline Dowd Hall returned to the question of racial and sexual violence that were at the heart of her 1979 path-breaking study, Revolt Against Chivalry, and she explained, I saw distilled in the Thomas hearings many of the preoccupations of my book, the links between language and power, the ways in which race shapes both black and white lives, the necessity of unraveling the race, class, and gender subtext, not only of the past events, but of every situation that demands a political response. Those issues are as pressing as they were 20 years ago. Indeed, the hearings and their rever reverberations, as well as the evolution of women's history, giving them more urgency than ever before. This combination of re-engaging old questions and articulating new, articulating new theories in the aftermath of the Hill Thomas hearings not only drove many of the innovations in the field of women's history, but also, as Hall suggests, mark the continued engagement of women and gender history with contemporary politics. In the wake of the Thomas hearings, historians of women called for a more nuanced application of race and gender theory that included black women's realities, redirected the study of women's history and gender history in particular, and inspired scholarship that changed mainstream narratives of American history. The call to make black women more visible and central to our understandings of racial and sexual violence with Darlene Clark Hine leading the way, led to a proliferation of literature that has changed how we think about a range of issues from slavery to the civil rights and women's rights movements. Just as the racial politics of the late 19th century required women's and gender historians to more fully embrace a theory of intersectionality, the sexual politics of the era also forced scholars to ask new questions and reconsider all formulations of gender and sexuality. The AIDS epidemic that swept through both LGBT and African American communities, President Clinton's Don't Ask, Don't Tell military policy, the Defense of the Marriage Act, and the brutal murder of Matthew Shepard left little doubt among scholars of women and gender history that more nuanced readings of sexual desire and sexual practices linked to gender identities are necessary. The 1988 publication of John D'Amelio and Estelle Friedman's Intimate Matters gave legitimacy to the emerging field of sexual history and sparked new questions in the field. The scholarship that followed in the 1990s made visible gay and lesbian history, challenged a linear model of historical progress from repression towards sexual liberation, blurred the boundary between homosexuality and heterosexuality, and forced a rethinking of the sharp binary in favor of the continuum. Moreover, the overlapping racial and sexual politics of the late 20th century called 
attention to the fine line between sexual pleasure and sexual danger and, despite, and inspire new research on reproduction and abortion, masculinity and homosexuality, sexual representations in popular culture and politics, the connection between religion, law, and sexuality, and medical technology in the gender body. Deeply committed to feminist politics, scholars of women's and gender history have produced a field of literature that has political and social implications well beyond the academy. No longer merely a field unto itself, women's and gender's history continues to inform our understanding of the U.S. past and calls for even deeper explorations of intersectional workings of race, gender, class, and sexuality. The 2004 presidential election of Barack Obama as the first African-American president his re-election in 2008, wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, economic collapse of Wall Street, attacks on the rights of immigrants, the rise of the Tea Party, the Occupy Wall Street movement, the campaign for same-sex marriage rights, the increase in sex trafficking, and the growing war on women's reproductive rights set out the new challenges scholars of women and gender history have already begun to tackle. Indeed, as Alice Kessler-Harris will point out, I didn't know what order I was going in, but I've read her paper. So, um, as Alice Kessler will point out, the CWH has made great strides toward the intellectual goals it set out all those years ago. Quote, injecting gender, if not women, into the historical process. And yet, the challenges of creating feminist scholarship I feel like it went out. And yet the intellectual challenge of creating feminist scholarship that places women at the center, theorizes race in multi multicultural terms, pushes for a more dynamic understanding of the relationship between race, class, and gender, and insists on sexuality as a useful category of analysis, remains critical to the politics of social justice and our campaign for racial and gender equality within as well as outside of the academy and the historical profession. Thank you. I asked you to go first because you provided such a fabulous analysis of the integration of real world politics and academic work. Our next speaker is Patricia Graham. Uh, who is a historian of American education at Harvard University, where she served as dean of the Graduate School of Education and directed the Radcliffe Institute, among many other leadership positions there. She has also been active in the national stage, having served as the director of the National Institute of Education and president of the Spencer's Foundation in Chicago. She's the author of seven books, most recently, Schooling America, How Public Schools Meet the Nation's Changing Needs. She sits on the boards of many learned societies and foundations, notably the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Pat. Thank you very much. You know, I'm here as the ghost of Christmas past. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, many of my colleagues will talk, as we've already heard, one fabulous paper uh, about current issues on women's participation in history and on the history of gender. My task, though, is to tell a story about the origins of the Committee on the Status of Women, in, uh, which began in late 1969 with Willie Lee Rose, a prominent American historian who was the chair, and the members were Hannah Gray, Carl Shorsky, Paige Smith, and as, with me as a replacement for Mary Wright, who was ill with cancer and died the following year. Now, why me? Well, that's a very plausible question, why me? I was then an associate professor at Barnard on leave at Princeton University that year to advise, if they wanted advice, on what they should do when Princeton went co-ed, which was that year. I was non-tenured and felt quite overwhelmed by uh, the prominence of my colleagues. The AHA committee reported with a uh, November 1970 document to the membership and to then the December 1970 AHA meeting in Boston. The context, of course, for the report was the 1960s, which some of us remember, some of you have read about. 
uh, <laughs> period of much upset nationally, particularly on American campuses, beginning with the free speech movement at Berkeley in the 64, the Columbia occupation in 1968, followed by deaths, demonstrations at many other campuses, leading to many injuries of various kinds. Professional associations such as the AHA responded with annual meetings, our maitre d'etre, vociferously debating various proposals on civil rights, women's rights, US policy and practice in Vietnam. Surveys revealed the paucity of good jobs for women academics. That was where we began. Our assumption was that we needed to get women into the field before we could get the history of women to be recognized. It appeared that it had not been widely recognized earlier. The academic boom years of the late 1950s and the 1960s brought unprecedented numbers of new faculty to the burgeoning and rapidly growing colleges and universities. They were nearly all men. However, the academic recession that began in the 1970s when jobs in the humanities, including history, shrank just as women substantially increased their numbers in the PhD pool. And we have seen no revival of expansions in history since then, alas. Now a little historical background on women in the doctoral pool. From 1920 to 1940, Women constituted over 45% of the undergraduates in the United States and over 20% of the doctorates, the high point for women until the late 1970s. The 1950s and 60s, women were down to about a third of the undergraduates and just about 10% of the doctorates, with the, women's, uh, the history women's doctorates even lower than that. The, the, the 1920s and 30s, when the PhD cohorts were small, that is small for both women and men, provided opportunities for some women who found jobs, principally in small colleges, both coeducational ones and women's college, but virtually none on the professorial track in leading research universities, which increasingly were trying to set the tone for what was good history. Whether they did or not is another question. Uh, less than half of these women in the pre-World War II uh, doctorates ever married. The women history PhDs declined dramatically from a high of 22% to a low of 9 to 11% in the 50s and 60s before jumping to 16% in the 70s, 33% in the 80s, and others we'll talk about more recent periods where it's gone up. But women, it, history women though have trailed the other humanities. For example, among 10 leading coeducational colleges the proportion of women full professors of history dropped from 16% in 1960 to zero in 1970. Presumably the result of the retirements of women hired before World War II and men who were hired subsequently. 10 leading women's colleges, including the Seven Sisters, which traditionally had hired women, also saw a decline, though less steep, in women, women full professors during the same period. The AHA, our organization, replicated this decline in the participation of women on the program of its annual meeting. 6% in 1939, 7% in 1949, 1% 1 in 1959, and the year of the founding of the Committee on Women, 1969, up to 3%. Subsequently, the fraction of women PhDs has risen sharply, now more than men, as the job opportunities in academe have shrunk. Now the research universities. They had been preparing women doctorates in history since the beginning of the 20th century. They hired their male graduates, but not their female graduates. Their female graduates typically constituted 10 to 15 percent. Uh, of the top 10 university departments in 5960, there were no women among the 160 full professors. A decade later, that is this growth period of the 60s, the departments had grown to 272 full professors, of whom there were two women, Mary Wright at Yale, Sylvia Thrupp at Michigan. When they did hire women initially, they were often outside the largest specialties of American and European history. 
Rather, they were in less populous fields where perhaps they were more visible, such as Chinese history, Mary Wright at Yale, medieval trade, Sylvia Thropp at Michigan, Armenian and Byzantine history, Nina Garsoyan at Columbia, uh, Byzantine history, Angeliki Laou at Harvard. To a considerable degree, these universities set the tone for the acceptability of women in faculty ranks. When the committee prepared its report in 1970, it did not recognize that the dramatic decline in proportion of women receiving doctorates coincided with the expansion of the history departments, nor did it foresee that the increase in women historians would occur when history departments were no longer expanding and even contracting. This did not make future secure faculty appointments in history easy for women or for men. The natural evolution of such an ad hoc committee was the creation of a standing committee on women in the AHA. That's always what happened. An ad hoc committee becomes a standing committee. And I became its chair. Willie Lee Rose, who would have been an excellent and appropriate chair, had become ill and was not available to be considered for this position. Among the key members of the initial standing committee was Linda Kerber, who subsequently chaired the committee. Now, from this point on, I have fewer, fewer archival materials to stimulate my memory about the activities of the committee. One accomplishment of the committee, however, requires no stimulation. That was the decision early on not to spend much more time trying to pass resolutions at annual meetings than a favorite activity of many women's groups within professional organizations. Rather, we believed that we should concentrate on something more effective, a hired staff member of the association who would work within the administrative ranks of the AHA to attend to women's issues. This would be an ongoing daily professional activity that would assure women's participation in AHA activities, including its committees and annual meetings, which would give them and their work added visibility. Many male members at the AHA in the early 70s viscerally resisted annual meetings when they were expected to vote publicly on issues of discrimination against women. Many would do so but frequently neither their minds nor their hearts was in their vote. More important, nothing much happened as a result of such a vote. However, for the tangentious voting to be replaced by a female staff member with whom most members would never have to deal was an instant win for the committee. <laughs> the council agreed. The committee then recruited an outstanding historian for this role, Dorothy Ross, seated two-thirds of the way back, a recent Columbia PhD in American history who had two small children and a husband tied to a career in Washington, D.C. As most of you won't know, she went on to a very distinguished career teaching at Princeton, University of Virginia, and ultimately the Lovejoy professor at Hopkins, from which she recently retired. She laid the groundwork for the long-term service of Nora Lee Frankel, also three-quarters of the way back, in this role. Finally, as a backstory to this institutional report, my own participation in these activities was powerfully stimulated and influenced by a small group of women historians in New York City who met fairly regularly through the late 60s and early 70s. Many of us had been graduate students at Columbia, and all of us were struggling to find and keep jobs that were related to what we had studied. Several were part of the emerging network of the Coordinating Committee on Women Historians, which was a powerful stimulus to the AHA in taking women's issues seriously. We met in each other's apartments, often at ours, since we live close to Columbia and the 116th Street stop on the IRT subway line. Many, but not all of us, uh, were interested in women's history, but we were all wrestling with what it meant to be a professional historian in a field dominated by men. We ranged in age from Gerda Lerner to Rosalind Rosenberg. We ranged in fields with some Americanists, but other Europeanists. Joan Kelly, Renata Blumenthal, Sandy Cooper. We also ranged in dispositions from <laughs> assertive activists to moderate progressives. We were a lively lot, and I owe them all a great deal. Thank you.
Thank you for that wonderful history. Um, our next speaker uh, will be Darlene Clark Hine, who teaches history and African American studies at Northwestern University. She was a founder of the field of African American women's history, as well as playing a key role establishing the position of African American history in the American Academy. She has been a tireless researcher, organizer, and teacher, having some 10 books and edited volumes to her name, most recently, Black Europe and the African Diaspora, co-edited with Tricia Keaton and Stephen Smale. She has organized any number of key paradigm-shifting conferences and has served as president of the OAH and the Southern Historical Association. Welcome, Darlene. Thank you, and you've done such a fabulous job organizing all of us like herding sheep or <laughs> cats or whatever you want to talk about, but you, you were just excellent, Laura. Now, my presentation is sort of like an outline. I have five points. I will make them very brief and, and quick, and I will call some names of people in the audience, and it may embarrass them. Um, <laughs> But I want to start with, with a personal note. Since the early 1980s, I have been haunted by Margaret Garner's life and story. In the process of collecting primary sources, records, documents, photographs, you name it, as part of the Black Women in the Middle West Archive Creation Project, I came across the newspaper accounts of an escaped slave mother who in her quest for freedom landed in Cincinnati. She hid with her children in an abandoned cabin near the Ohio River. She thought she was safe, but she was not. Upon hearing the approach of the slave catchers, Garner slit her daughter's throat. Garner lived albeit in a state of dissociation. Her story, life, was abandoned, if not completely erased from history. Part one, the teaching division of the AHA. In 1983, the teaching division, under the leadership of my then colleague, Harold D. Woodman, invited me to organize a conference on the state of Afro-American history at Purdue University, and incidentally, to raise all the funds to make it possible. <laughs> Eli Lilly, the Eli Lilly um, Foundation did support us, so did the uh, NEH, in order to make it possible for young historians, especially those at historically black universities uh, to attend this conference. LSU Press published the edited presentation uh, of the edited volume of presentations in uh, 1986. Two, one former and one future historians of the AHA were in attendance. John Hope Franklin delineated in his keynote address the generations of African-American historians who had created the field of African-American history. And he didn't mention any women. <laughs> Thomas Holt gave one of the most fascinating introductions I've ever read, and I reread re it often. It posed the question, whether now and why. Thomas Holt wrote that intellectual and political considerations are pervasively connected and interactive, especially in African American history. A review of the past 30 years of impressive scholarship by the architects of black women's history and gender studies underscores one of Holt's major observations. He said that important work remains to be done beyond the recent acceptance of African Americans as a valid and legitimate endeavor within the profession. He added, 
In doing this work, we young African American historians are charged with a formidable task. He declared, one, we look back now to change that profession, meaning the historical profession, and to refocus its Eurocentric, male-dominated views of the world. And the black women historians in the audience said, right on, Tom. <laughs> we must move beyond, between two levels, he continued, two levels of experience. We must occupy two vantage points simultaneously. We must do history inside out and back again. Today in 2014, I concur with the two simultaneous vantage point theory, but suggest that for those of us who teach and who do black women's history, we must do it from the bottom up, and now we must do it from the bottom down. If we are to focus attention and to reconstruct the political, social, and cultural history of those who make up the ranks of abandoned Americans, especially those below the bottom Americans, black women and their children and the dispossessed of their communities. Gerda Lerner, I'm going to come to Gerda Lerner in a minute. One of the omissions of the 1983 AHA Purdue University Conference was the absence of any formal presentations or discussions of black women's history as a distinct field of study. This was in spite of the fact that in the 1970s, an energetic and intellectually dynamic cohort of young black women historians courageously founded the Association of Black Women Historians. One of the founders, Sharon Harley, is in the audience. Betty Gardner, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, Betty Collier Thomas, Rosalind Turbord Penn deserve credit for laying the foundation. And at the very first meeting of ABWH, which was held in association with the Association of the Study of Afro-American Life and History, we granted recognition and awards to the significant path-breaking monographs written by Jacqueline Jones and Deborah Gray White. That was the beginning. Shortly thereafter, the ABWH launched with, Ger with Gerda Lerner an invaluable uh, project that would be des was designed to provide invaluable support and encouragement to black women historians. Working with Sharon Harley, Gerda Lerner secured funds from the uh, Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education. That was the first kind of foundational support this new field would receive. And Gerda was really uh, instrumental in getting that together. And the idea was to organize panels on black women's history at the OAH. Gerda Lerner was also a strong supporter of my application for the NEH-funded Black Women in the Midwest Archival Creation Project. Gerda and I agreed on one essential point, and we talked about this often. There were many other points we didn't agree on, <laughs> but that was Gerda. Gerda agreed with me that black women's history would be dependent and was dependent upon the degree to which scholars within the academy were able to secure the cooperation of black women in their communities. And that's why we did the project, and that's why I wrote that book, The Truth is Told, the monograph on black women's in Indiana uh, history, and on the back, if you're fortunate to have a copy of that book, which is now selling for $50 on eBay, and it's only 90 pages, 
Gerda Lerner says, this is an invaluable book that everybody should read. <laughs> she was such a proponent. Uh, in 1990 and 1991, Ann Scott, okay, three minutes, Ann Scott, uh, as president of the Southern Historical Association, asked me to chair her program committee and to make sure that black women historians were engaged. Following Lerner and Scott's leadership during the presidency of my, uh, of the OAH in the Southern, I also asked black women and white women scholars to chair the program committees. And in that way, we were able to put on programs black women scholars who are working in this field that many people still had serious questions about. This is the final point. There, there was, not unexpectedly, considerable opposition to this new field. A white female historian suggested to me that black women were not only, quote, outside of history, they were beneath history. I was troubled by this notion of being beneath history. Who is beneath history? Maybe those people that historians don't study. <laughs> Others objected to me, person, because they said black women's history had no theoretical foundations. So we had to create some, intersectionality being one, the culture of dissemblance being another, and I was dissembling a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Colleagues asked me to consider whether I was doing a disservice to black women, to black women graduate students, by supporting their dissertations on black women's history. Would they be able to find jobs or publishers? Who would evaluate their scholarship when it came to promotion and tenure? A particularly well-meaning colleague feared that I was committing professional suicide myself because, as he put, put it, black women were not that important. He later, 10 years later, apologized and assured me that black women were important. Now, the final point that I, I, I want to make is that the field has become accepted. We have hundreds of graduate students all over the country who are doing phenomenal work. There's a book series, there are prizes, the Darlene Clark Hine Prize, for example, uh, that Wanda Hendricks worked so hard to raise money for. The OAH gives each year to the best book in black women's history and gender studies. I would be remiss, however, if, the, if I did not note at this juncture, very publicly, two black women graduate students who walked beside me from the 1980s all the way up to today and they are still with me and they were trained in black women's history and they believed in this field when there were so many doubts even at Great Purdue and they are Thavolia Glimp at Duke University. Stand up Thavolia folks can see who you are. And the other one is Wanda Hendricks, who has a new book that just came out on Fannie Barrier Williams down at the University of Illinois Press. Uh, one of those women we discovered in doing the Black Women in the Middle West Project, and over the last 15 years, Wanda has been researching her autobiography, and the book is very is published. I feel vindicated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wonderful paper. 
Uh, our next speaker is Natalie Zeman Davis, uh, who uh, cannot be here today, but she very graciously uh, sent a paper, which I will read in her stead. Uh, Natalie Davis uh, currently teaches at the University of Toronto after having been a member of the history department at Princeton University for many years. Her importance in establishing the field of women's history, I think, doesn't really need um, much further of uh, much further underscoring uh, particularly for those of you who were at, at uh, Rebecca Scott's lecture this morning where she talked about uh, some of the contributions that Natalie has made to the field but I do want to underscore her role particularly in establishing the field in the in European women's history as well as the fact that she was the only the second uh, woman to preside over the AHA in 1987. The first was Nellie Nielsen in 1943. Uh, so um, for the next few minutes um, I will be Natalie, um, a task I wish I could live up to. Before I look to the future, let me evoke the exhilaration and hope of 1971 when the Committee on Women Historians was founded. The same, Jill Care Conway, that the same year, Jill Care Conway and I were introducing our course at the University of Toronto on society and the sexes in early modern Europe and modern America, and exchanging our mimeograph syllabuses with others who were starting their own courses across North America. Collaboration was the order of the day as we sought both to win women a play a place of equality in our profession and our universities, and at the same time to give new attention to the deep history of women, sexual experience, and gender over the centuries. The movement was inclusive, from graduate students to full professors, insofar as any of us women had that position, and relatively non-hierarchical. We had some male supporters in those early years. I recall, for instance, Gerhard Weinberg as a faithful presence at the annual AHA breakfast of the Committee on Women Historians, and dear Larry Levine as a major supporter of our women's struggles on several fronts at Berkeley in the 1970s. Our vision was wide in that we believed that the changes we sought would benefit not only women, but could bring greater equality to social relations and communication in our world of work and add complexity and new meaning to all fields of historical inquiry, a vision expressed in part in the statement of purpose of the Committee on Women Historians, quote, to foster an inclusive scholarship that challenges and transforms the practice of history, end quote. This collaborative spirit was maintained despite differences of opinion, sometimes quite strong, on tactics and alliances, and on interpretive questions, such as the nature-culture debate, still an important question, what with the transgender movement and new perspectives on the interaction between genetics and early childhood development. I recall this ethos not just out of nostalgia, but because ideally a reconstituted agenda for the Committee on Women Historians might hope to elicit some of the same spirit. As Lyra Auslander affirmed in her call to this, to this panel, the initial goals of the committee have been achieved. Women are fully present in the historical profession in North America, and the history of women and gender is vigorous and enduring in most, if not all, fields, including global history. The social transformations wished for perhaps naively in the early 1970s, have been limited by powerful economic and political structures. As our universities become reconstructed as businesses with managers, women and men are both nestled all too comfortably in the offices of deans and provosts. Some women in positions of authority have resisted this trend, but like men, women come in all sizes and shapes. Any number of queens and duchesses will come to mind. Three other changes since the 1970s, all of them linked to the globalization of capitalism and to the new technologies of communication and surveillance, also provide a useful frame for conceiving future directions for the committee. Mm -hmm. The questions that exercised us as scholars and citizen activists in the early 1970s, the years of Roe v. Wade, gender equality in education, work, and family, control over one's, women, one's body, and acceptance of diverse sexual choices are now center stage, hotly contested political issues all over the world. Second, the multiple resistance movements in the West have been lively in their criticisms of inequality, impoverishment, the drastic erosion of democracy, and more, 
but limited in imagining alternative arrangements, other possible ways in which human life could now be organized on our planet. Some brilliant dystopias have been produced, but little by way of inspiring or re well-reasoned utopias. Third, generations of young people in North America, women and men, are being raised in families, both local and immigrant, and in settings where there is no discussion of the ideas of second wave feminism or of the feminism current and embattled in different parts of the world. The word is not getting out sufficiently beyond our courses in women's history and our gender studies programs. Let me suggest then two areas which the women, Committee on Women's Historian, Women Historians could include in a program for the future. The first would be an extension of our mission to transform. To me, history, and especially gender history, has always been a surprising and endless source for different ways of organizing human society and thinking about it. Pervasive patterns appear, but in widely varied and contrasting forms. Why not build upon this rich resource and the habits of research and analysis it depend, demands from historians so as to encourage innovative reflection on alternate ways that human life could be conducted for the better of our planet in the future? <coughs> and reflect, too, on the kinds of historical processes that might be able to generate such arrangements. I am visualizing here conferences and workshops and publications for perhaps five years, drawing on women and men from different fields and different lands and traditions. Gender relations and gender experience would be, central, would be a central problematic, but as always, these are closely linked to other relations of power and patterns of making and exchanging. I said ways in the plural because many proposals would emerge and be debated, and who knows? Perhaps some might take hold. Secondly, the Committee on Women Historians could focus on various ways of reaching young women and men in high schools and community centers and other settings beyond the universities with accounts of the history of women and gender in North America and in different parts of the world. Here I think of task forces to develop such a project, brainstorming sessions in collaboration with non-university teachers and community organizers and with young people themselves from different backgrounds. Others might propose videos on the history of women and gender that could be circulated electronically. I'm not proposing that such projects would be carried on by the Committee of Women Historians, but rather that it stimulate them, start them moving with the historical profession at a time when the need for such knowledge and hope is profound. I end with thanks to the Committee on Women Historians for all they have done for the profession for women over these 42 years. I recall the CWH breakfast at the annual AHA meeting in December 1985, after I had been elected president of the association. Though I was a plausible candidate, my success was due to a collective effort to end the 44-year break since the first female president. We did it, we did it, were my words to our smiling group. And indeed, the CWH has continued to do it. Many good wishes for its future. Natalie Zeman Davis. He is always a source of endless inspiration. Um, as is our next speaker, uh, Linda Kerber, uh, who retired last year from the, history, from the history department and law school at the University of Iowa. Uh, who was a key member of the group who recreated women's history from the late, in the late 1970s and early 1980s with the publication of Women of the Republic, Intellect and Ideology in Revolutionary America and her ongoing research at the intersection of politics, law, and gender, she has continued to change how we think. Linda Kerber, excuse me, change personalities. Linda Kerber has been an equally tireless teacher, mentor, and mover and shaker. She served as president of the OAH and the AHA, as well as the ASA, and on numerous editorial boards. Linda. I start with my gratitude to Natalie. Um, when I was chairing the CWH, Natalie was on the council. And I think Dorothy Ross will remember, others will remember, that there were times when we and the committee ended up in Natalie's hotel room uh, with Natalie on the bed with no shoes and us in various states of disarray, uh, offering her our worries, our concerns, our 
hapless strategies and Natalie saying, well, the hapless strat Natalie turning the hapless strategies into uh, approaches that worked. So uh, it, it's good to follow her in, in, in this moment. I start with a memory of the CWH that remains vivid 40 years later. It was 1972, I'm pretty sure, and the AHA was in New Orleans. We created a panel called Lives of Women Historians. It was explicitly a generations panel, not unlike this one. The eldest member was Constance McLaughlin Green, then in her early 70s, I thought she was terribly old, <laughs> uh, who had never had a tenured position, but had creatively made a career as a public historian and put her experiences to use in the histories she wrote. She had won a Pulitzer Prize. The youngest was Ellen Du Bois, then a graduate student. In the middle were the remarkable Anne Scott, who had worked in Washington during World War II and entered graduate school only after marriage and children. And Mers Tate, a pioneering historian of international relations at Howard University. It was a very 60s, I mean, this is 1972, it was a very 60s, early 70s sort of occasion. Each historian spoke of her distinctive struggles. No one had had an unproblematic path to her career. We were in an enormous room, it was bigger than this one. Uh, one woman after another rose to speak bitterness. We heard of women whose negative tenure decisions had come from five guys standing on a stairwell landing. We learned of salary inequities, overloaded service expectations, intimidation in what we had not yet learned to call hostile environments. We heard from women whose only professional opportunity laid hundreds of miles from their partners. We spoke only of husbands. Uh, condemning them to exhaustion, expense, and sacrifice. Without family stability, women dared not get pregnant. They were torn between the creative work they loved and the families of which they dreamed. Remember, there was no legal abortion quite yet, and even after there was, if this is a wanted child, there were no sonograms, there was no amniocentesis. The window for a healthy pregnancy was short and unforgiving. I was considered an elderly prima gravida at 26. The chances of birth defects rose then and rise now sharply by 28 or 30, and that age has not changed. Afterward, emotionally drained, the committee ended up, everyone had left, we ended up in a circle, it was the 1970s, in the back of the room, joined by an older woman who was on the council, and she was furious. Sub, such self-indulgent complaints. In her day, women did what they needed to do to be professionals, and they didn't whine, they persevered. And if that meant choosing between children and the profession, so be it. And then suddenly, her voice softened, the words burst out of her. I'm sure she had no idea that she was saying them. And she said, and all my friends are grandmothers now, and how do you think I feel? We all leaned in, we were all talking at once, yes, 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 we said exactly, don't you see, we don't want anyone ever again to have to make such false choices. We want a profession that is safe for private life and a professional life. We didn't say, but we thought it. Men do not have to choose between their professional lives and being a father if they wish. Why should we? And we committed ourselves, I know I felt it then, to reveal the hypocrisy of a profession that prided itself on intellect and objectivity and patronized the very women they had taught in their own graduate programs to whom they had awarded uh, degrees and to whom other you know, people like them, they were dependent for the richness of their own family life. We were not going back to the 1920s, we believe. So here we are 40 years later. When Laura Auslander, Leora Auslander had initiated the brainstorming gatherings after the women's breakfast, the bitterness spoken was somewhat different, but very much present. 
Much of what has been said in the last few years of brainstorming has expressed the insecurities women now share with men who are entering the profession as the very norm of the tenured professor gives way to adjuncts and the superstars of MOOCs. Many report petty but cruel and harmful practices directed at transgender people, at lesbians and gay men. And many describe a profession that still assumes that the norm is a family with a single earner, a single professional who is free to uproot partners from jobs and children from schools, to relocate for research or a residential fellowship. In the pages of Perspectives a few years ago, then AHA President Barbara Weinstein, who is here, powerfully described the impact of a profession that continues to assume physical mobility uh, on a family, the impact on the family that does not fit those assumptions, as few of our families do these days. And when the family in question includes people with disabilities, or the need to stay near frail parents, the impact is even more heartless. And yet we still see the growth of research fellowships tied to centers for advanced study and the static state and actually declining in real dollars of portable fellowships, Guggenheim, ACLS, and especially the NEH, now threatened yet again with near destruction. And if I had time, I would do another polemic on how we have to save the NEH. Again and again, women rise to speak of the bitterness of positioning family life against professional life. Early in the 20th century, male scholars pointed to the low rate of childbearing among academic women as evidence that intense study undermines reproductive capacities. Are we so far past that? We know from an AHA report by Rob Townsend that Debbie Doyle wrote about in Perspectives recently that the average age for historians at the first stable hire has been ratcheting up in the last decades, positioning the tenure clock against the biological clock. In 1980s, the average age at first stable hire was 33. In the 1990s, it was 34.7. In the 2000s, it's 35.7. That's nearly 36 at the time they are hired. And tenure decisions are generally made six years later. You do the math. We need to take to heart the chilling findings of a 10-year-long study by the AAUP and the University of California, Berkeley whose principal investigator is Mary Ann Mason. It was recently published as Do Babies Matter by Rutgers University Press, but preliminary findings have been appearing in the AAUP's academe. And the findings place us back in the world of the early 20th century. Only one in three women who take a fast-track university job before having a child ever becomes a mother. Women who achieve tenure are more than twice as likely as their male counterparts to be single 12 years after earning the PhD. They found what many other studies have established that women are heavily overrepresented in the ranks of contingent faculty. And, and this is a statistic I want you to memorize, this is a pop quiz, men with babies and who ent been with babies entering their families within five years of receiving the PhD are 38% more likely than their women counterparts to achieve tenure, 38%. Several years ago, I served on a committee charged with constructing a report on gender equity at my university. In the course of my work, I found myself at lunch with eight women from a variety of departments, physics, English, whatever. In my university, pregnancy leave still must come from sick leave pay. Men get to be fathers and save their bank sick leave against the day when their illnesses strike. All eight women had delayed pregnancy until tenured or close to it, and every single one had had a medicalized pregnancy, bed rest, other medications, and all the expense and anxiety that involves. In every medical school in the country, faculty know and medical students learn 
that the likelihood of miscarriage and birth defects increases substantially after age 30 and continues to rise. And yet on other parts of the same campus, long paths to degree and eligibility, long paths for eligibility for tenure, shepherd women into late pregnancies. No one has ever, as far as I know, actually measured the costs in heightened medical insurance that's paid out for these medical pregnancies. And the human costs cannot be measured. So this is not about leaning in. It is not about organizing our days better. It is about institutionalized selfishness. When Pat said we had a job, our job included institutional transformation, and it was Leora, I thought, I didn't sign on for institutional transformation. What can I say? But it's institutional selfishness reflected in the different impact of parenting on the likelihood of tenure. Another of Mary Ann Mason's findings, academic men generally report that they have as many children as they wish for, whether it's zero or whatever. And academic women regularly report that they have fewer children than they wish for. And so I dare say that this is institutionalized malpractice when in the medical buildings we teach one thing about life chances and in all the rest we shepherd childbearing age women into dangerous choices. They think they're making free choices. They are not always. This is, I'll end, this is not a set of problems for women alone. It is not wholesome to live in a context that is so unrealistic, that shunts aside the great joys and tragedies of life, that lives by the fiction that it's possible to cordon off professional work and leave life work to others. That fiction sustains an archaic gendered division of labor. It is long past time to reconfigure the academy so we can do our best intellectual work. It is much harder to do it now than it was in the 1970s when we were surrounded by other progressive movements and could ride their wave. It is harder when those who benefit from the structures now in place can plead the dreadful economy as the excuse for their failures of imagination and creative deployment of resources. In the 1970s, the committee's main worries were the closed pipelines to admission fellowship first jobs. In our context, in which only 50% of new PhDs get stable academic positions, we must gather force to resist the undermining of the academy itself lest no one have any jobs to take maternity leave from. The committee cannot do this work alone, but the committee has a long history of naming the challenges we face. And we know that we have many allies among men, some of them are here in this room, I won't embarrass them by naming them, who have been with us for the long haul. And we have allies among women throughout the academy. They will join us, but we have to ask. That was great. Uh, our last speaker this afternoon uh, is Alice Kessler Harris who teaches American history at Columbia University. She is the author of a series of foundational texts at the intersection of women's gender and labor history. Her women have always worked to definitively debunk the idea that women's work for pay is a new phenomenon. While in pursuit of equity, women, men, and the quest for economic citizenship, she elucidated the relationship between workplace and polity. Her lifelong commitment to working for gender and class equality are also evident in her most recent book, a biography of Lillian Hellman. She too, like everyone else here, has been a very active institutional um, person, whether, that was, whether she signed on for that or not, <laughs> and was, all, was a former president of the OAH. Alice. Thank you, Leora, and um, I think everybody should take a nice deep breath 
after these four wonderful five, including Natalie's presentations. And since I'm the last speaker, I'm going to beg your indulgence. Hold the clock for a couple of minutes. I want to make a couple of side comments. The first thing I want to say is that key to everything that we've all been able to accomplish in the last whatever it is, 40, God forbid, 45 years, oh my God, is uh, solidarity. And I want you to look at the panel in front of you and notice that we have all learned to express our solidarity by dressing in black. <laughs> <laughs> Black with a little touch of red is okay, a little purple, but it has to be black. S but solidarity, I'm serious about. But the second thing I want to say is a comment on Margaret Garner to Darlene. I teach a class at the Columbia Law School on the law and history of motherhood. And one of the cases we use regularly is the Margaret Garner case. And what I wanted to say to add to the poignancy of Darlene's story is that Margaret Garner went down into the law books in the following way. The big argument in law was whether she should remain in Ohio where she would be tried for the murder of her child or whether she should be transported back to Kentucky where she could not be tried for murder but would be tried for the theft of property because that's what her child was. In the event, the owner, the slave owner who chased down Margaret Garner, chose not to try her for murder because after all, she would then be hung and he would lose his property. So they brought her back to Kentucky, tried her for theft, returned her to slavery, and she ended up in a picking cotton, I think. Um, somewhere in the deep south for the rest of her life. A double uh, poignancy because not only was she pushed into this you know, really awful act, but she could not even mourn the act. After all, she had just stolen property, somebody else's property. So that's my Margaret Garner story. I have a couple more anecdotes. I'm going to tell you one more and then you can start the clock. <laughs> uh, the Committee on Women Historians. Some of you know that the Berkshire Conference on Women his of Women's Historians had been meeting as a small group for many years since the late 1930s. It met for many years in a small inn in uh, southern Connecticut or upstate New York. And when I was in graduate school, I was taken off to this Berkshire conference for the first time by a woman historian named Margaret Judson, who you've probably never heard of, who was a very well-known constitutional historian in her day. Small group, tiny meetings. And then in 1969, 1970, the AHA began discussions about whether there should be a committee on women's historians. And Joan Scott, who was part of those original discussions, came to our Little Burke's meeting. 30 women, you know, New York, metropolitan, New England area, uh, half of them quite elderly and the other half quite young, as I once was. Uh, and Joan Scott tried to persuade us to persuade the AHA or to add our voices to the AHA. And you're not going to believe this story, but we all drowned Joan Scott out with a round of pressure saying, no, no, we wanted women's historian. We wanted the historians of women to have a voice. 
but the AHA was no place to exercise that voice. It would simply betray us. We were going to create our own association. Well, we did, and they did, and a thousand flowers bloomed, but I thought you'd like the fact that this CWH started with the hostility of people like me who later became the chair of the CWH. Okay, you can start the clock now. Um, my CWH, my Committee on Women's Historians, I was uh, chair of the committee from 1983 to 1986. And I was chair, it was a great moment. I mean, it was the moment when the CWH, uh, Committee on Women Historians, we were established. We had won significant victories. Uh, we had issued a graduate student survival guide that Nora Lee Frankel had engineered through the committee. Uh, <laughs> right, we had, well, right, that had already been done. That's what I'm saying. Not that we did it, but it had been. We, we did it. Right. <laughs> That's we called solidarity. <laughs> we did. Yes, yes, Linda's committee gets credit. Uh, we, we were already, we, the AHA, the, the larger Committee on Women's Historians, I don't get any personal credit for any of this, uh, were gathering data, so we already had numbers which demonstrated how many women and where they were and so on. We were worrying about minority women. We were delighted uh, when, uh, it was during my presidency, nothing to do with me, but the Association of Black Women Historians was created and there was immediate sort of uh, pleasure that that seemed like yet another step forward. Uh, we were discussing the issue of spousal hiring, you know, before that there had been nepotism rules which prevented usually women from being hired into the same departments and even the same universities as men. That issue was now on the table. Uh, there, uh, I think, and I do think this was my committee which actually voted to persuade the AHA to move the, ja the December meeting. Did you know that all the AHA meetings were in that week between uh, Christmas and New Year's? when women were, well, men and women, men were delighted to leave their families and their children who were home from school to go to a convention, but women often refused to go even if they'd been invited to the convention because how do you leave a family and kids in the middle of their school vacations? And we, uh, the Committee on Women Historians, suggested the move to January, which we've since done. Uh, Natalie Davis was elected president. I mean, I could go on with this, but the most important thing that happened is that we were so pleased and so optimistic that Nora Lee Frankel developed the idea of giving every departing committee chair a rose, and I'm wearing my rose. <laughs> we all got one of these little necklaces with a, I'll show you later. <laughs> But uh, as you can see, there was a kind of optimism, a kind of sense within the committee that uh, women's position was changing and that we had moved uh, a, a good distance and would continue to move. Natalie's election as president of the AHA was only the sort of final celebratory moment of many celebrations up to that point. In retrospect, when I think about that, I think we were too sanguine. That is, that we took too much for granted. We'd made great strides towards our intellectual goals, Natalie's paper being the best illustration of that. We'd injected gender, not women, uh, into the historical process. And generally, that was the direction in which we were turning. We were silencing those who asked if we put gender into the center of our analysis and invigorated the study 
uh, sorry, we, was, we were silencing those who asked, so what, if we put gender into the center of our analysis? That is, how did it matter? We weren't yet paying attention to that question, nor were we paying attention yet to transnational analysis, and it would await another five or six years before we began paying attention to the call by African-American women's historians for what became known as intersectionality. In my own field of labor history, class was completely separate from gender. That is not understood as part of it. And yet, we've moved intellectually to meet some of those challenges at least we have those challenges in front of them if we haven't yet replied to them adequately. But if we've gone some distance to meeting those challenges, when I look at the data, it looks to me as though we have been stymied, stifled, topped out, glass ceilinged, whatever it is, however it is that you want to describe it in terms of where we are in the academic profession. We've made, if you like, and I'm here using Virginia, the sociologist Virginia Valiant's concept, we've made slow progress. Progress indeed, but perhaps too slow. Much slower indeed than in other humanities fields, where the progress towards introducing women into the field. In English, uh, in the field of English and literature, about 55% of those who teach at the college and university levels are now female. In history departments, that figure is about 40%. And that figure of 40% has remained pretty stable for the last 20 years. Oh, some years it goes up to 41% or 42%, but then it drops down in the following years. In 1980, women held about 15% of all faculty positions. Minority women held 7% of faculty positions. By 2010, 30 years, I can't only have five minutes. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I'll talk faster. <laughs> By 2010, um, uh, minority women held about 15%, so their numbers had more than doubled of the faculty positions in history departments, but closer to 18% in other departments of the humanities. So progress, but not progress as fast as it should have been. And although the proportion of women had doubled from 15.5% to about 33% of the women, of, the, of, the, um, uh, uh, of all the faculty people holding positions in research uh, universities, even that number was double, but not triple. What it, which is what had happened in other programs. So I, I could go through, and I, I won't because of the time, but I could go through the numbers a little bit, and I could talk, I could pursue the uh, problem that um, uh, Linda laid out to you of faculty, uh, uh, women being disadvantaged by rules of pregnancy and parenthood, uh, marital status, divorce, and separation also, it turns out, plays a huge role. And interestingly enough, the other role that, w the other thing that plays a huge role is that while more than half of all male historians are married to females who have PhDs and are working in fields that can be supportive to them, uh, only about a third of women are married to people who have PhDs. Uh, the assumption is that their partners are not as supportive of their work as the partners of men are. What is to be done? That's the question I want to ask. 
Our challenge for the future is to encourage the AHA and the professions as a whole to adopt a far more capacious view of historical practice than it's been able to do in the past. To acknowledge, uh, I want to acknowledge here the work that Jim Grossman of the AHA has been doing in this regard with respect to public history, for example. But as our generation rooted demands in the framework of a thriving women's movement, of a thriving political force that pushed us forward into institutional change, whether we wanted it or not, as our generation tried to promote a commitment to the breaking down of barriers to women, of solidarity, of community in the profession, I, I, I'm going to get there, it's all right. Uh, of solidarity and community in the profession. So I believe that this generation needs to be concerned with the larger egalitarian goals of our society and of our world. We need to be concerned with environmental, with ecological, and especially with issues of inequality in the marketplace. I'm not suggesting here uh, that we uh, alter what we do as historians so much as I suggest that we shift our aims as professionals within the AHA from those of enhancing women's professional opportunities to advancing the integration of intersectional, collective, social responsible, socially responsible, integrative, I don't care what word or what language you use, I won't quibble over that. But what we need to do as historians is think about this association and our work as part of a movement towards socially responsible and collective action. The actions that have so often been part of women's work in the past. I think there are four ways to do this, and for lack of time, I'm gonna go through them very quickly. The first is that we acknowledge and address the shift of universities into corporations. That we stop denying that uh, that's what universities have become, and we start treating jobs and access to jobs uh, uh, we start confronting the ways in which they are actually done instead of the ways we pretend that they're done. And I can elaborate on that, if you like, in the question period. The second is to accommodate and take advantage of new meanings of family life. Uh, parenting is one of those meanings but there are many others, so that we can take advantage of uh, reconstructed and newly constructed families in many shapes and many forms, uh, instead of participating in healthcare systems, job-related systems that assume that every historian has a wife, whatever that means. Uh, I could do that, but I have two more points, short ones. Uh, we can think about the ways that political context, uh, we, we can and we should think about the ways that political context affects our lives as women. And here I suggest that we look at the larger place of feminism, especially in our lives and in our communities, so that when we hear things like lean in, as Linda suggested, we respond not by looking to our own individual advancement, but by thinking about the ways in which women as a whole, the profession as a whole, can make a place for itself in, a, in universities where now humanities in general are under attack, women in the humanities even more uh, so. If we restore a vision of feminism from personal success to socially collective action, we move ourselves to a different place of thinking about how we can act within universities. And finally, the intellectual 
purpose. And here I think the AHA, as it can help with all the others, can help with this. And that is, uh, we need uh, to encourage an intersectional sensibility, if you like. That is, we need to resist the notion that gender history, women's history, black women's history, that all these are separate fields, separate units that belong in separate departments. And if we mean what we say about intersectionalism, then we need to get universities and their curriculum committees and courses to acknowledge that race and sex and religion and gender all of them are bound up in an inseparable unit. My hope would be that like the fingers of the hand, which we used to be told were so weak, that we can as women once again construct the fist that will alter the world around us. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, let, let me say that uh, I agree with you that, that, yes, we did start there, and we would never have been able to start had there not been an active women's movement, and had many of us not been part of consciousness-raising groups and various other movements. But having said that, uh, uh, I want to also say that the 1970s was a period of just immense dramatic change in the law, among other things, in the recognition of women as professionals, in the dropping of barriers in professional schools and single-sex schools, and so on and so forth. By the time we get to the 1990s, we're in a different place. And it's that place that I think we have to begin to operate from. We're in a place where feminism is diffuse. I'm not one of those people who says it's gone. I don't believe that. But I do believe it has now diffused into a number of different directions which don't always agree with each other. And at the same time, a neoliberal headset, if you like. I, I'm not talking about neoliberal economic policy, but a neoliberal value set which values individualism, which values leaning in as opposed to social concern and collective responsibility has taken over. It does seem to me that in the courses that we teach, in the uh, efforts that we make to promote gender equity as well as minority equity and so on in universities, in the protests we make against the end of um, uh, incentives, for example, which my university used to have incentives to bring minority students into the graduate program. Those incentives disappeared five years ago, you know, under the neoliberal strategy. So it does seem to me that if we acknowledge that there has been a change in the public notion of how it is that we move ahead, and that it's no longer about pulling everybody up with you. It's about you're getting ahead because you're the best. If we can acknowledge that, confront it, and refuse to go along with it, that we can alter, in small ways, the cultures of our own institutions. And that's what I'm trying to say. And I agree with you 100%. I agree with you. Um, in, from a black women's history perspective, we looked at we look at a lot of the uh, the history that we did as first generations. We were trying to discover all of the uh, respectable representative uh, lifting as we climb black women out there to prove that you know this this we were worthy of study, and somehow that created a split in our community at some level because there were all these other women who were suffering because of the, the adverse negative uh, political and social policies in the larger society, but we were pursuing a progressive onward and upward, uh, you know, to be the first here and the first there and the best that, and we 
lost our political mooring as scholars, I think. Yeah. And what I, why I was referring to Tom Holt so much was because he was saying your politics and your intellectual work, they have to somehow coincide and connect with each other. And if you disjuncture them, you're going to lose something in the process. And so I, I think your question was right on target, and I also think what your response was really well put. Yeah. Can I speak, Can I speak to that? Uh, I made a choice, uh, in some ways maybe hapless, of using my time to tease out the nuances of the, uh, the pregnancy issue. And I mean it, you know, specifically to pregnancy. But I align myself with the question you raised. When I chaired my department, um, we had something like, we, our department's a little larger than 30, we had 28 people not on leave. Uh, one third of them, there were seven people in the department who if they met their classes at all, uh, they were being heroic, absolutely heroic. I did not ask them to serve on any committees. One of them had an Alzheimer's mother who had just landed on her doorstep after the brother had, you know, run out of energy. One had a teenage son who had an undiagnosable uh, medical condition and was hospitalized for seven months while they figured it out. One was a colleague whose wife had been diagnosed with a cancer from which she would die within the year. Not a single one of those issues um, uh, had to do with pregnancy or childbearing or even child care. And in fact, there was an eighth uh, who I did not know about because, you know, chairs learn only what they're told of these personal things, uh, who had a suicidal family member who did indeed suicide two years later. Uh, so what I am, I'm using in some ways the pregnancy issue and the childbearing issue First, to identify the fakeness of choices because there are people who, have, who make authentic choices about the shape of their personal and sexual and intimate lives. And I want them to be free to make those choices without their university in their bedroom. But I also was using, thought I was hoping to use the issue of pregnancy as a, a, a metaphor or a signal or a sign of the larger question of the whole life, the life that is lived in people, in relationships mm -hmm. to people. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's horizontal as well as vertical over time, mm -hmm. and it's that part of our lives that I want us to recognize and not shrug away. Mm -hmm. So I think we're on the same. I, I, we're on the same I want to quickly I? make a, a different kind of answer. Um, I know there are a lot of other people, I, which is, I think you're also talking, they're, they're ta there's, a, there's the institutional question, but I think you're talking about knowledge transmission and an idea that knowledge is passing from one generation to another and what, what, what in a quite literal age kind of way, as opposed, not just to biological reproduction, and if we're stifling ourselves in some ways by doing that. And I think that's right. I mean, I think, I think this is a legitimate model. I think it's an important model. I think it's far from a sufficient model. And I, I'm fully convinced that we all get stupider as we get older as well as smarter, in the sense that there become things that one cannot understand in the same, that, that uh, there's a lack of, a, a decrease in optimism. Having been around the same block too many times, you no longer see the block the same way. And you need somebody who's never been around it. So I learned, for example, tremendously from my undergraduates. And I hope they learn from me as well, but that it is that there is all kinds of knowledge moving in all kinds of directions. And we, uh, with respect to both age and also social position, class, and privilege. And so we need, a web might be another metaphor. There are other ways of thinking. And maybe something to do is to organize a panel that, that, try, that, that move next year, that moves out of this into another kind of analysis that turns it upside down or tangles it up in a different way. So, Lior, can I just add one small thing to that, which I think probably Jenny knows I'm going to add, which is to say that if you look at this panel, 
four of us, five if you include Natalie Davis, are of an age. We are of an age when we were educated, brought up, uh, responded to a particular kind of politics, which was enormously useful for as far as we went in changing the profession. And you're now getting the blowback from that. The blowback in terms of, oh look, Princeton has a woman president, and so does X and Y and Z. You know, even Harvard has a woman president. <laughs> look, there are no more problems anymore. And yet, the undercurrent of this is still sexual harassment in the workplace, pregnancy discrimination in jobs of all kinds. I want to say to you that this generation, and it is generational, pushed the way we needed to push in the world we live in. I think the generational question is significant. And I want to say to you, take the ball away from us. <laughs> take it away and try to figure out what your politics are now and how in the light of your politics you can create the institutional structures or at least the institutional pushes, the institutional knowledge and the institutional threads that will pull you forward. I don't think this generation can do it anymore is what I'm saying. But, and I would, can, yeah, I, go can I just add, oh, sorry. Um, I mean, as the person who's not, not in this generation. Sorry, <laughs> Crystal. <laughs> um, but has benefited from this generation. And this is one of the things that I struggled about in terms of which paper to give, uh, because I know that I've benefited. But I also, and as a historian, uh, so, and as a historian, you know, I, I believe in acknowledging what has come before. I think that that's just part of what we do, and it's part of who I am, um, and a part of coming out of African American culture is that you, you know, you're always thinking about your elders and what they've done to pave the way for you. But I for us, but I also think we can learn from their mistakes, we can learn from their successes. And one of the things that I've learned over time with teaching and as I get older is how much my students don't know about what historically has happened. And I think that we could easily, I mean, no, no offense, but we could easily forget what this generation has done. And I think, um, and we can learn from, from I think what um, Alice has said, you know, that we were too sequin, that we, we focused on this, but we didn't focus on that, and, and take lessons and run, run with it, and re, reinvent how we think about politics and what um, women and people of color need in the academy. Um, so I would just add that bit. I want to say a word or two about the university issues these days. Uh, one of the things that, not many things keep me up at night, but one thing that really worries me is what's happening to the college university scene in America. And within that, what is happening to the study of history? But one thing we did not talk about in any detail, although several of us mentioned it, is how interest in history as a subject has shrunk. Shrunk, shrunk, shrunk. And the, the involvement of universities, as Alice has mentioned, has enormously increased as corporate entities so that the cost of attending a university now is extraordinarily expensive and if you go to a private institution without much endowment, your college debt, if you couldn't pay for it, is extraordinarily expensive. And in the high school world, what the high school people are being asked to do is, pre is prepare graduates for the workforce. The only purpose of, higher, of elementary secondary education that we hear about these days is capacity to enter the workforce. That is what's happening to our liberal arts graduates and to our history majors. And as historians, it seems to me that one of the issues that we need to be facing is how we make the case for the kind of education that we offer our undergraduates. Not so much our graduate students, they've already fallen off the cliff on this subject. 
but that what we do with our undergraduates to understand that the reason you go to college and the reason that you study subjects like history and other humanities is broader than what you're going to than what you're going to use instantly in a job because as many know they don't use that in a job so i think we have a this is that next generation problem that i think some respects alice was referring to as figuring out why it is that the work that we do is valuable for the next generation what is it about what we do that is useful for the next generation, because they're not following us right now. Uh, is it Claire who asked the question about um, sexuality? Um, one thing I find myself thinking is that in the uh, the forced generic generalizations that we were all making about you know, what we were all up to. One thing that did not get described in any detail was the uh, tangle, the intersection of the women's history we were revitalizing mm -hmm. and the women's lives we were trying, women's professional lives we were trying to make. And I remember an early meeting of the committee under past leadership in which we had a long, long, because none of us were then doing women's history, we had a long discussion about what the, whether we needed women's history as well as women's claims. And in that, those years, um, what got, what happened, and I think of two specific acts. One is Carol Smith Rosenberg's Female World of Love and Ritual, and the other is Blanche Cook's Women Alone Stir My Imagination, that simultaneously with all this, I mean, we're making a lot of whining about the profession, but the work we were doing was uh, rethinking of what history construct, you know, consisted. And um, in doing that, um, lesbian women were key and often running point on that. And as space was made for women of a range of sexualities to have a history, then this solidar you know, then there was a phalanx that could move into both reclaiming history knowledge and also claiming respect in the profession. This is oversimplified. But I think that um, that is definitely part of the project that I think we were living through. So I, I want to give you a slightly different answer, Claire. Uh, I want to say that when we first started to study women's history, it was really woman with an A, you know, woman's history. Uh, that very quickly ended, as you know, and by the 1970s, women's history had fragmented in many different directions in the recognition that woman was not a so-called stable category. When it fragmented, we won something and we lost something. What we won was a lot of additional knowledge about sexuality, new forms of finding evidence, new claims to knowledge, with respect to minority women of all kinds, with respect to um, sexuality and sexual preferences. But we lost something as well. We lost the capacity to think and to act as a group, that is, to push for what we wanted. And so we had a committee for this and a committee for that and a committee for the other thing, and none of those committees did or got anywhere because we were fragmented as a group. And now what I'm suggesting is something else. We live in a world where young people are unemployed. We live in a world where half, more than half of the people who get PhDs in history in America this year will not find jobs in the field. Under those circumstances, it seems to me, the Committee on Women Historians stops thinking about 
their navels, if you like, or women, whatever that means, but starts thinking about the more general problem of how do we expand the numbers of jobs? How do we expand the meaning of history so that more people are eligible for more jobs? How do we become an inclusionary, not an exclusionary political force? And I, I think that if we could think about ourselves that way, we could actually begin to engage in political activities that would, you know, that would serve the interests of all of us, whether we're gay or straight or, or you know, parented, parenting people or non-parenting people or black or white or whatever the issue is. I think it's the succumbing to divisions uh, I think that's true throughout the workforce, but I think it is especially true in academia where questions about who's, who has a claim to which kind of job or who's eligible for it is so often a subjective but, uh, judgment. Does, doesn't that... Go, speak into the mic, please. Speak into the mic. Doesn't that also involve asking questions about what kinds of history Absolutely. Absolutely. Are relevant right now? What yes. are the big questions that we should go after? Is there some place that we can have a conversation? Like I'm really beating this drum about the abandoned Americans because so many Americans are increasingly falling into that sp space where we don't know who they are, we don't know what they're doing, we don't know what's happening to them. And a lot of PhDs with history uh, backgrounds falling are falling space. into that abandoned space. So some place we have to talk about this, the larger societal institutions Absolutely. and culture that is increasingly uh, rendering, erasing people. Yeah. You know, I'm just absolutely. erasing absolutely. people. I'm, I'm uh, and, and I think that's the broadest. Yeah. 